working. It's morning. Strictly speaking, it's morning for me um, because uh, I'm, I'm talking to you from uh, my home in, in, in the UK. Um, but isn't it wonderful? We've got this technology and the ability to uh, share knowledge and to engage in this way. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and thank you for your comments. Right. So what's this session about? This session is about helping you fulfill your potential. This session is about making sure that you're going to get the marks that you deserve in the SBR exam in December. And in order to do that, I want to take you through the marking process. In fact, I want to appoint you to be an ACCA marker. I want to put you in the shoes of being a marker and learn some lessons and reflect. And then I want to take you through a question on the ACCA practice platform, that, that, that tool that we are all using at the moment to prepare. There'll be a short break at some stage and I'll want to have your questions and have your answers. So whilst I'm generally talking, if there are little things that are cropping up that relate to exactly what I'm saying at the time, drop them in the chat. All right, now I can see the chat, drop them in the chat. If it's something very pertinent to what I'm saying. If it's a general question that you wanna ask me at the end, then put the question about anything to do with SVR, but put that in the Q&A, put that in the question and answer session, and we'll have a little bit of time at the end to try and address some of those questions. So the first thing I wanna do is to say hello, is to introduce myself. In my twenties, I was a ACCA student. It obviously was before the internet and I did these exams. I was working, I was under pressure, I was newly married and I can remember what it was like and qualifying for me was life-changing. Now I qualified whilst I was working for KPMG, but I quickly realized that uh, the profession was not really for me. Maybe, maybe I should have stayed, maybe I should have earned some more money doing that, but my vocation was teaching. And I joined a company, Emil Wolf, and then we became FTC, and then we became Kaplan. And for many years, I ran the ACCA aspects uh, of Kaplan out of London, and that gave me a tremendous opportunity to teach uh, abroad. And in fact, I ended up uh, seven years ago taking a job with a regional provider and based myself full time in Singapore and taught across Malaysia and Vietnam and, 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 and the region. And when I came back to the UK three years ago, I wanted to do something different. And so I got involved with online learning, which was in its infancy at that time. And it's been a blast. It's been fantastic in terms of the reach and in terms of, for me, continuing to learn and to be able to reach out to students. So I continue in my relationship with ACCA. They engage me from time to time to do student facing exercises like this and train the trainer exercises and various things behind the scenes. And I also run a very uh, successful and popular podcast. And one of the things that you should be doing, I think, if you're doing SBR, is listening to my podcast because it's free, it's short, it's exam focused, and it's very easily found on Spotify. It's very easily found by searching, yeah, um, Tom Clendon. I have an unusual name, yeah, podcast. Tom Clendon, SBR, you will find it. Trust me, you will find it with a few clicks. So look, I very briefly introduced myself, and I think it's perhaps uh, appropriate that you introduce yourself and the medium that I want to use 
to get to know the audience a little bit better is for me to find out by using polls. So using the technology that we have at our disposal. Now the ACCA has moved exams to being computer-based and therefore has made available to everybody for free a fantastic platform, test reach, but we call it the CB, the, the ACCA practice platform. And I'm curious how many times you've logged into that in the last seven days. Now, this is an anonymous poll. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm just genuinely curious. Now, I can see a number of you have answered, but I would like a little bit more engagement, please. Yeah, a little bit more engagement. I've nearly got 80% of you who have replied. I'm just going to give you five more seconds. Five, four, two, three. Counting was never my strong point. Okay, we've got over 200 of you have replied. And it's pretty much a three-way split. I appreciate your honesty. Those of you, 33% of you who have said that you've not logged into the ACCA practice platform in the last seven days. I appreciate your honesty. Please tell me though, in the next seven days, you are going to do so on numerous occasions. Let me tell you why. The ACCA practice platform is exactly the format is exactly the technology that you will be using to sit the exam in three weeks time. And it's a little clunky. It takes a little bit of getting used to. You know how Word works, you know how Excel works, but it's not the same. It's a different form of software. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be taking a driving test, you take the driving test, you practice in the exact same car, that you take your driving test. You don't practice in, a, in, a, in an automatic and then take the exam and a shift stick. It just, it, it's not the right preparation. Everybody, and only a third of you have logged into the practice platform more than once in the last seven days. Everybody needs to make the practice platform their favorite website, their home. My country, England, my sport, rugby union, and England are playing Australia today. And they're playing Australia in England at Twickenham. England are at home. Now, because they're at home, we expect England to win. Yeah. West Ham beat Liverpool last weekend. West Ham were playing at home. When you're at home, you're comfortable. When you're at home, you can just concentrate on the game. When you're away, things are against you. So you've got to make the practice platform so familiar that you feel like it's your home. So in the exam, all you're concentrating on is the questions rather than how to move around the windows. Anyway, my, my lecture is over. My passion is over in respect to that particular question. But I do want you to um, I do want you to be very uh, familiar with the practice platform. Let me ask you another question. Let me ask you another question. Bit of a cheeky one, really. Yeah, a bit of a cheeky one, really. I talked about my podcast. And maybe some. And I'm curious as to how uh, uh, what proportion of you have come across that podcast before. And I can see people answering away. And uh, one of the options is what's a podcast? Well, a podcast is a audio file that you can listen to for free. A podcast is a little bit like listening to a radio show 
all right, a show on the wireless. And handy, um, uh, I can see that 18% uh, of you have indeed come across my podcast, listened to it, benefit from it. There's over 30 episodes on there. Most of you haven't, but I hope one of the takeaways from today is access to that free resource. So you will be easily able to find the podcast by searching on Google or any other search engine, Clendon, my name, podcast, or Clendon SBR podcast, or Clendon ACCA podcast. Um, and if you go on Spotify, if you've got Spotify or any other podcast platform, uh, they're all on there. Um, final question. Curious. Again, trying to instill some uh, good practice uh, in you. Um, you're doing an exam. Where are the marks? That's what the focus of today is. Where are the marks? And I can tell you where the marks are. And you can log into this presentation and, and, and whatever. But it's, I, I, I won't be telling you lots of secrets in a way because the examiner's reports are there. The marking guides are there. And I do appreciate your honesty. I do appreciate your honesty in some of you saying that you haven't looked at it. But I hope this is going to be a prompt that best practice is that you take advantage and you do. Um, yeah, this is being recorded. It is being recorded. It will be shared. Um, so thank you, Jay. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, most of you, well done. Most of you, well done. Yeah. Uh, you are reading examiner's reports. So am I. You are looking at the marking guides. So am I. Uh, fantastic. So thank you very much for humoring me on those introductions. Um, and those resources, of course, can be found on the ACCA practice platform. I want to promise you, I want to assure you that the ACCA take the marking of your scripts really really seriously and professionally. And because of the use of technology, it's a much better system, secure system, fairer system than it ever has been. There's a team of people involved in marking your scripts from the individual markers who then have their team leaders who then feed into the marking session lead. Because there are four exams a year, the examining team sort of share out the responsibilities. Now, what happens in the beginning is that when the scripts, when the exam is over, a sample of those scripts are then marked by the examining team and they standardize the marks for those particular scripts. They sit and they argue and discuss and clarify exactly in, in not, not in abstract, but in reality, what particular scripts should get particular marks. And those scripts are then fed out to the, to, to, to the team, to the individual markers, who are asked to mark them blind. And they've already been marked, but they get to mark them. And then they learn if they've been a little bit generous or a little bit harsh, they take on board the feedback. And of course, you can imagine because with computerization, as a marker marking scripts, the, uh, the, the, the number of marks being awarded is something that can be very easily monitored. And with every batch of scripts, there will be a seeded script. There will be a script that the examiner has already marked, fed back in blind, so that the quality of the marking can be maintained. You understand about big data, mining, control systems. So do the ACCA. So the quality of control. And if there's any query, that the marker has, they refer it up to the team leader. And then the team leaders can refer it up to the examiner. 
these scripts are marked to the highest standard. I know it's a slightly opaque system in the sense that, you know, um, you, you're not involved in it, but I can assure you, and I'm not an ACCA employee, I can assure you it's something that they take really seriously and the use of technology has been revolutionary here. And let me tell you a little bit more about some of the fundamental principles. Sometimes students say to me, my answer is not very good. It's not as good as the examiner's answer. Oh my God, I'm a failure. I can't, I can't produce an answer as good as the examiner. Well, nor can I. Nor can I, because the examiner has written the question, the examining team have got all day to write an answer, and they're writing that answer for your education, your reflection, and not writing that answer specifically as an example of what you can achieve in 30 minutes, that is a pass. The answer that you're reading is not a pass. It's the gold standard. It's the platinum standard. It's, it's over the top. So don't beat yourself up that your answer is not as good as the examiner's answer. And don't beat yourself up that you might be making a point which is not specifically in the answer anyway. These scripts are professionally marked. Some of these questions are very open-ended. And credit can be given for sensible points that are made, even if they're not specifically mentioned in the answer. If you guess and you get it wrong, so what? Yeah, no negative marking. Yeah, and if you're not very good at spelling, yeah, that's me. If you're not very good at grammar, that's me. And English is my first language but I'm still not very good at it when it comes to writing. But it's not, it is not a test of your ability to write, yeah? The golden rule, one mark, yeah? One mark per sentence, one mark per mini paragraph, one mark per valid point made. That's the golden rule, all right? No one ever gets a half mark. You either get the mark or you don't. And of course, marks can be maxed out. If it says four marks, you can't be given five. Even if you make five valid points or six valid points or seven valid points, if it's for four marks, you're only going to get four. It is frustrating seeing students sometimes write too much as if they're wasting their time. So marks can be maxed out. Own figure rule. Imagine you calculate goodwill and then you do an impairment review on that goodwill. If you have miscalculated the goodwill figure, by definition, the impairment review will be skewy, will be wrong. But you can still get the marks for the impairment review if you've done the right thing to the wrong number. So please, yeah, again, don't beat yourself up. You, the, the, it is the method that is being marked rather than the actual correct answer. Right. This is an important moment. I would like you, please, to read the question. I'd like you please to think about this question. In the exam, we have exhibits, background information, and we have requirements. Alpha has recently acquired a controlling interest in beta, means alpha's the parent, beta's the sub. It's the policy of the group to measure NCI at fair value. There are two different ways of measuring NCI. One is a fair value, one is a proportion of net assets. Requirement, five marks, eight minutes, yeah? Eight minutes. 
explain how the impairment review on the goodwill arising on the acquisition of beta will be conducted and any impairment loss accounted for? That's the question. And this is an answer. This is an answer. Please, can you read that answer? And I am appointing you to be the marker. So one minute, please. Yeah, one minute, please. Read the answer and think how many marks you would award it. Now, actually, I find that answer quite difficult to read because it was in a block. One of the ways of better um, structuring the question is to, is to break it down. So the data here is exactly the same. Now, what I'm going to do is to use a poll to ask you how many marks you think you should be awarding the answer to this question. So this is a bit of fun. We're on a learning journey. We're on a curve. Yeah, we're trying to take on board yeah, what it's like to be a marker. And I can see that um, most of you are responding. Some of you may still be reading the question and thinking about it. And of course, what we've got is quite a distribution of marks. So let me just give one more minute. No, not one more minute, 10 more seconds uh, for anybody who hasn't made up their mind to have a vote. Okay. So I can see the results there. And of course, we've got a variety of different answers. We've got some people who say it's worth almost nothing, nil or one. Half of you think it's worth a couple of marks, two or three marks, and a third of you think it's brilliant and, you know, really a top-notch answer. All right. So let's have a begin to review uh, the question again. Explain how the impairment review on the goodwill arising on the acquisition of beta will be conducted and any impairment loss accounted, five marks. Now, what's been written? An asset is impaired when the carrying value of an asset exceeds the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the higher of the value in use than the recoverable amount. Should say fair value, less cost to sell, whatever. Second paragraph. Goodwill is a premium that arises on the aquas on the consolidation, the aggregate of the controlling interest and the NCI exceed the fair value of the net assets acquired. Yeah. Impairment losses are charged to profit. Yeah. Unless the asset has been revalued. Oh, that's good. Because if you revalue an asset, you do charge the impairment loss to equity until the revaluation reserve is exhausted. Yeah, that's that's spot on. There are various indicators of impairment. Yeah, that's true. Some are external, some are internal, absolutely. And impairment losses are ignored. Uh, impairment losses uh, are non-cash expenses that are ignored for current tax purposes. That's true. They create deductible temporary differences that create accounting for deferred tax assets. That's true. My nephew, 
lives around the corner. My nephew is the eldest son of my eldest sister. So my nephew is 33 and he has a child, my great nephew, Louis. And Louis is learning to speak. And I saw him yesterday and I said, uh, how old are you? And he said, yeah, my name is Louis. So when I asked him how old he was, he said, my name is Louis. So he was right. His name is Louis. But he wasn't answering the question, was he? I don't like this answer. Somebody has memorized this answer. Somebody has looked at this question and thought, write everything that I know about impairment of goodwill. I don't care about the revaluation of an asset because goodwill cannot be revalued. I don't care about the deferred tax of goodwill because goodwill is ignored for deferred taxation purposes. I don't care about the indicators of impairment because goodwill is subject to an annual impairment review. This is a poor answer. The person who's written the answer has knowledge. I'm not doubting that. It is basically technically correct. But it's Google. It's a brain dump. It is not mentioning the word beta. It is not mentioning the word alpha. It is not answering the question. And that's why, in my judgment, I'm struggling to give it one mark. I really am. Yeah, I really am struggling to give that answer one mark. Maybe the fact that it's charged against profit, you know, you might on a remark, look at it and think, oh, well, if they're getting 48, 49, you might go back and try and find a mark. But my gut reaction for this answer is to be pretty brutal. Yeah, there's not much good about it. it it's mostly bad and ugly. It's mostly bad and ugly. It doesn't show any application. All right. So although it's technically spot on and shows that somebody has studied the standards, it means that to get marks, you've got to show application. So I, I would vote zero or maybe one. You know, I'm I'm and I'm one would be generous. Zero would be my default. Now, I hope that's not. Too shocking for you. Let's have a look at a second answer. Let's have a look at a second answer. And again, I'd like you to be the marker here. I'd like you, and, and there'll be a poll in a minute. So have a read of this second answer and think what you would give this second answer. What I like about the answer is there are five points. You know, there are five paragraphs. It's required by High Forest 6. I don't care about the name or number of the accounting standard. That's not where the marks are. But I'm very pleased that it's talked about as being an annual impairment review. I think there's some typing errors going on. Um, there's mention of a CGU. 
Um, there's impairment kisses, which is new to me. Um, and there's references to things being split with the NCI. So let's think about this second uh, answer. And let's think about how many marks specifically you might give this second answer. There are five points available. And I can already see some people are giving five. And I can already see some people are giving two. And I can already see some people are giving three and four. So I, I've left out zero and I've left out one. Um, I'm just making you think how many marks you would award for this. Interesting, very interesting. Okay, okay, so the most popular answer is three marks. There's one or two of you out there who are kidding yourselves that this is worth five marks. It's not worth five marks. No way is it worth five marks. And there's a couple of you out there who are, well, there's 30, a third of you are, are maybe a bit mean at two marks. Let me, let me, let me try and explain. Let me try and show. Um, I think the fact that we've mentioned um, an annual impairment review, I, I you know, I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, whoops, I'm inclined to, uh, sorry, let me go back. I'm inclined to go back here and to say that because it's required for an annual impairment review, I'm inclined to give that a mark. Um, the second and third point, I think together is worth a mark. So I think there's a couple of marks here on the left hand side because we've made specific reference to an annual impairment review. We've made specific references to an annual impairment review. We've made, I, I'm sort of half about this CGU. I don't like, I don't, I, I like it, but I don't like it. If we're explaining something to somebody, we shouldn't be using jargon. So CGU is a cash generating unit and we should be writing it out as cash generating unit. And it is charged. So there's a couple of marks here, I think. As NCI has been measured at fair value, goodwill is in full. Impairment loss and goodwill will then be split with N. Beautiful. Technically spot on. I love it. So this is my third mark here, definitely. And when NCI is measured as a proportion of net asset, but it isn't. It isn't. So that last paragraph is redundant information. It's technically true that when NCI is measured as a proportion of net assets, it's only attributable to the parent, and that's accounting for, that's how it's accounted for. So I think for me, the nearest answer that what I'm gonna to commit to is three marks. That's what I'm gonna to commit to. Yeah, that's the second answer. And for me, that second answer, I don't care about the spelling. I don't care about the spelling. It, it's reasonably clear that that top that fourth paragraph, top right hand corner, definitely worth a mark. A couple of marks on the left hand side. Now, over to you. Over to you. Can you? use the group chat to tell me how we can improve the answer that you've just seen. Has anybody got any ideas as to how we can improve the answer that we've just been looking at? Because I'd like to leave you with a perfect answer. And thank you, Sandy. Use the name beta and alpha. Thank you. Yeah. Combine with facts from the cases. Yes. Shulu, thank you. Excellent. So that's showing application. Yeah. So when you're explaining, ideally, you shouldn't use jargon. 
So, look, structure. Did you notice the wording of the question had and? The wording of the question had and. It's how it's going to be conducted and accounted. So part of the answer is about the conduct of an impairment review, and part of it is about how it is accounted for. That word and is the most beautiful three-letter word that you're going to come across in a requirement, use of the name. Technical content. We made a passing reference to CGU. If you're doing an impairment review on goodwill, it has to be in the context of a cash generating unit because the recoverable amount is what you can sell it for. The recoverable amount is the cash that you would get if you keep it, but goodwill you can't sell and goodwill doesn't generate any cash. So fundamental to an understanding of how we account for a, how we conduct an impairment review on goodwill is the explanation of a cash generating unit. It's fundamental. Sticking to answering the question, there is no need to talk about what if NCI is a proportion of net assets. And it's a very small point. But strictly, strictly speaking, I don't like bullet points. Yeah, the markers are not wanting bullet points. They're wanting white space. They're wanting sentences. But dashes and bullet points look like plans. And we can do better than that. So look at the way the answer is highlighted now. Explain how the impairment of view on the goodwill arising on the acquisition of beta will be conducted and any impairment loss accounted. So there are two parts to the answer. How is it conducted? And how is it accounted for? And I think they're slightly different. The standard, you don't need to quote the standard, the name of it. The standard requires the goodwill of beta. Ooh, 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 we've used the name of the company. It's subject to an annual impairment review. ka -ching. Impairment losses arise when the carrying value of an asset exceeds the recoverable amount. True, but we're not leaving it there. The recoverable amount of goodwill cannot be assessed because you can't sell it and it doesn't generate any cash flow straight into the application. That's why we get involved in a cash generating unit, bracket CGU. And we define a CGU, it's the smallest collection of net assets that generates an independent stream of income. It's a matter of judgment. How do we account for it? Charge it in the PL and non cash expenses. Yeah. And the business of NCI being measured at fair value means goodwill is in full. And because goodwill is in full, the impairment loss is split. Oh. I'm sitting down already, but I feel whew, I feel I've got there. The beginning was a brain dump, zero. The middle one, a reasonable attempt, two or three out of five. This one for me smashes it out of the park. Can you see the difference? Can you see the journey we've been on? Can you see the improvement that has been made? Can you see why an answer like this? is so much better because it's structured, because it's applied, because it's technically correct, because it's answering the question, yeah? So maybe this is a bit of a wake up call for some of you. Maybe some of you, yeah, are kind of like, yeah, okay, come on, Tom, get on with something else, you know? But hey ho. So that answer is simply the best. Yeah, that answer is simply the best. Okay. So on reflection, 
on reflection, what should we be doing better? On reflection, we should make sure that we answer the question. And that to me involves, if possible, planning the answer. And I'll show you how that works out. Yeah, we've got a sort of a live question that we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to use the name of the company. It's a very small, simple trick, but it works. It makes you think about that you're addressing a person and a company and a situation and that you're not just Googling and you're not just brain dumping. And we're going to try and break everything down. All right. So these are the general tips, the general kind of um, positive things that we can do. Let's have a look at another question. And, 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 and what I want to do in this question is to, is to build it really. Um, and I want you to think about this question. This is from the September, December 2020 exam. And the requirement was describe the main challenges in recognizing and measuring intangible assets such as brands in the statement of financial position. That's worth five marks. And unusually, well, it does happen in, in, in exams. You don't, there's no specific exhibit. So there's no context. There's no name of a company that we're going to be using here. And I want you to think about how you would structure the answer. How many questions are you being asked there? Is there the word and in that question? Describe the main challenges in recognizing and measuring intangible assets, for example, brands, in the statement of financial position. So how are these marks going to be earned? How are you going to plan your answer? What are your headings? These are rhetorical questions, but I hope you know that we're going to try and break it down. And one of the things we're going to do is to talk about recognition. And one of the things we're going to do is talk about measurement. And I've got the word intangible asset, which strictly speaking is a technical term and therefore worthy of defining. Yeah, just like in the last example, impairment loss, that was defined as part of our answer. In a strange way, I think this answer should be worth six marks. Because in a strange way, when I look at the breaking of it down, I see we've got to define an intangible asset, talk about a challenge, talk about what is meant by recognition of intangible assets, talk about a challenge, talk about what is measurement of intangible assets, and talk about a challenge. That's what I mean by breaking it down, breaking the requirement down. And if you break the requirement down, it then gives you an ability to pick up the marks. And let me try and show you what I mean. So this is where a little bit of knowledge, this is where a little bit of brain dumping can sometimes come in handy. Intangible assets are non-monetary assets. They have no physical presence, but they have to be identifiable. Challenge. Challenge, how do you identify something that you can't see? How, how do you describe green to a blind person? <laughs> how do I describe green to you? How do I know that the color green to me isn't the color red to you? How do we, how do we get that? Anyway, that's... So intangible assets don't have a physical presence. The challenge, therefore, is how we identify them when they can't be seen. It's a start. 
it's a start. Recognition. Recognition means debit and credit. Recognition means something is included in the accounts. And under ISA 38, because that's the standard on intangibles, to recognize an intangible asset, there has to be a probable flow of benefit that's capable of reliable measure. Now, ultimately, if you wanted to bring in the framework and say the revised framework has different recognition criteria, that the revised framework has relevant and uh, uh, faithful, I might give you a mark. But the revised framework is overruled by the specific contents of the standard. And therefore, I'm not sure that I, I, I'm, my answer is not going to be constructed there. How do you know the probable? There's a challenge. How, how do you know there will be future benefits from a brand? How do you know there's going to be future benefits from a drug? How do you know there's going to be future benefits arising? You don't. So there's a, there's a challenge there around estimating the future cash flows, about the discount rate that you would use, about how reliable the information is. If you're capitalizing these intangible assets, there's an issue around, you know, are they technically feasible, commercially viable? It's all subjective. There's a lot you could, you could almost write a thesis here. Yeah? Stick to something, short and sweet. The picture, by the way, I don't know if you recognize the picture. Um, some people look at it to the left and see a duck. Some people look at it to the right and see a rabbit. Depends what you recognize, I suppose. Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? It's a famous image anyway. And measuring. Two ways that we can measure cost or value. Now, obviously, value becomes the most challenging one to measure. Measuring cost is relatively simple. So if I was looking to answer this question, I would talk more about the value, measuring value, because fair value is difficult to measure. I know we've got a standard on it. But when you're dealing with intangibles, there's no market. There's no market um, because they tend to be unique. But you do have to recognize an intangible asset when you are buying a subsidiary that the subsidiary hasn't recognized. So a subsidiary can't recognize its own brand. A subsidiary can't recognize its own customer lists. But as a group, as a parent buying the sub, you've got to do that assessment. And that is effectively a challenge because there's no active market. So it's thinking about breaking the question down, defining an intangible asset, looking at recognizing, looking at measuring, constantly thinking about the challenges. Yeah, constantly thinking about the challenges. Now, I can't, I can't help myself by giving you a little bit more information, but I don't think this information is in any way, shape or form directly answering the question, but you're going to get a different question in the exam next time. Now, I say 38 is a very old standard. It was written 20, 30 years ago in an in a analog age, and we now live in a computer age. Many brands are missing from the balance sheet. So arguably the accounts are incomplete. It's, there's, a, there's a genuine weakness in financial reporting because eBay, Uber, yeah, WeChat have built up, uh, Airbnb have built up these really valuable brands and they don't appear on the balance sheet because you can't recognize your own brand on the balance sheet. 
because it's marketing costs and advertising and that gets expensed. And so there's something wrong somewhere because we're not showing the changes in the value and we're not giving good stewardship because of ISA 38, because we live in a very internet world where intangible assets, the more you use them, the more they're worth. If you think about a brand name, or you think about a website, the more it's used, the more it's worth. Now that's totally counterintuitive to a car or a building or a spade. Traditionally, tangible assets, you, they wear out. So you depreciate them, you systematically write them off. But intangible assets, the more you use them, the more they're worth. It's a bizarre world. And I say 38 was written in the previous century, in the previous millennium. It's a very old standard, needs revising. So criticisms of it will come up again, I'm sure, in the exam. For the record, that's the examiner's answer. The examining answer didn't break it down into defining, recognizing, measuring. The examiner's answer is that answer. And at this level, you must appreciate that there is sometimes more than one answer. So there are many challenges in recognizing and measuring intangible assets such as brand and set. True, yeah. Many intangible assets are not frequently traded. So there's no active market. We made that point. Valuation is more difficult. Intangible assets are unique, not easy to identify. Valuation methods are complex, subjective. Generally, the reason for admitting them is a perceived lack of link. An expert is required to judge your answer. But if you write nothing, you get no marks. You've got to write something. You've got to focus it on the requirement of the question. And if you can break the requirement down into talking about recognition, into talking about measurement, that's the approach that I take. I try and answer the question. Of course, the examiner's answer is worth reading. Of course, the examiner's answer is a good source, but it's not necessarily what you're going to produce in the exam. So we've got to be trying to break things down and be structured. Right. Let me have a look at the time. We have been going for nearly an hour, and that's fine. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to change gear and we're going to go on the practice platform and you're going to see me work a question um, and do that. But just before we do that, I can't, if we're talking about how to earn marks, one of the things that I have to talk to you about is professional marks. And in SBL, oh my God, in SBL, it's all professional marks, isn't it? Um, but in SBR, in terms of professional marks, there are four. And in the ethics part, in the ethics part, um, you're really going to earn those professional marks by making a very, very direct and clear link to what's going on with integrity, competence, confidentiality. Yeah a direct professional behavior, direct link, and also suggesting action points. So try when, you, try when you think about an ethical issue, try and end your answer with a point of, of, of what to do. In terms of professional marks in section B, it's a little bit more, um, and I hope this doesn't come across as flippant, but you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. If you've put together a good answer, yeah, it's more likely to earn professional marks than a bad answer because 
professional marks means it's complete. It's rounded. It's thought through. And, you know, you're going to get professional marks effectively. Could you present this answer to a client? Or is it a hodgepodge? Yeah. So something that's well structured, well rounded, thought through. Well, and the marker has obviously an element of discretion there. So I'm going to stand up. I'm going to go and get a cup of tea. I'm going to give this a three minute break. We've been going for nearly an hour. And uh, some of you can find me on LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to. Some of you can find me on Spotify. Yeah, and bookmark it and come back to that later. But in the second half, I want to take you through a question on the ACCA practice platform. I want to show you how I would answer a particular exam question under time. So you're going to see me, yeah, be a student, be a good student. So let's take a break, three minutes. Yeah, I will return. I will return. Short break, please. Yeah, stand up. Move around. Yeah. Stretch. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, standing up. You can see I'm wearing jeans today. Myself a cup of tea. We are going through a short break. If any one of you would like to grab a tea, coffee, or go for a quick toilet break, you can do so.
Okay, so here we go. Um, we've been going for nearly an hour. We've got an hour left of our presentation. And the first part of the presentation was a bit of introductions, taking you through a couple of questions. The first one with kind of three different answers and trying to get you to appreciate that it's not about memory dumping, that it's answering the question, trying to make the points, and then trying to put that into practice with an exam question and breaking it down and looking at the word and, and, and structuring and trying to find marks for points. Now, what I thought we could do is have a look at the practice platform. And so you can see here, top left-hand corner, the web address, all right? But you probably will access your test reach, um, your practice platform through your My ACCA account. And a number of you haven't accessed this in the last seven days. Um, but I'm assuming that all of you, all of you are going to access it this weekend. Let's see if we can make the internet crash. Let's see if we can, all of us, get onto the ACCA practice platform, do a mock exam, see the resources they've got there, yeah, and get familiar with the practice platform so it becomes our home. So um, the question I want to do here, I've got to navigate through the question. I don't want to do Columbia. I don't want to do Bismuth. So we're into, I want to do question four. Sometimes people find question four a hard question. And maybe it's because they run out of time. So what am I going to do with this question? Um, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to answer it. I'm going to, I'm going to be a student. And if I look at a question, you get an opening set of information in the middle of the screen. Collat produces aluminium, natural disaster, costs have gone up. Um, they had to replace a supplier. Year end is 31st December. So the disaster happened just before the year end. There are exhibits about non-current assets. It's not that sexy. It's not that exciting. The first thing I really want to do is read the requirement. But if you've ever been with me, you know that I don't really read the requirement in the requirement section. What I want to do is control copy C and I want to close that window off because life is short and um, I just haven't got the. Oh, dear, what's going on? Ah, you see, here we are. I need to concentrate on one thing at a time. So I'm selecting all of the information. I go control C. I then into the word processing option. I then go control V. Paste. There we are, pasted in. So there we are. And I can close off the uh, requirement. Now what I've got here is the ability to answer the question. And there are three parts of the question, A, B, and C. Well, I can only do one thing at a time. So let me just concentrate on part A. What is part A about? Investors need to understand a variety of factors when making an investment decision. The nature of companies is they're looking to invest is an important decision and needs to incorporate sustainability, which is the sexy current issue of the day. Discuss why sustainability has become an important aspect of investors analysis there is no requirement to refer to the exhibit professional marks will be awarded okay um right so i want to write something down here four marks four things to say there's something about long term so something about i don't know sustainability oh, mm. Only if a business, only if a business is sustainable, will it survive and trade in the future? Investors are thinking long term 
sustainability reports. We'll discuss how the business model will adapt to climate change. and the risks it faces yeah i don't know something like that so i'm talking here and each time i do this question i do a different answer um so only for business to be sustainable will it survive and trade in the future so you know that's that's fair enough but we can think about customers yeah um businesses which are sustainable will attract customers, those that pollute, use plastics, chop down trees, etc., run the risk. of being boycotted by the public and not winning contracts uh, from other sustainable businesses. All right. So, you know, I think that's a valid point to make. Why are so state, why has it become an important aspect of investors analysis? Because investors are thinking long term, sustainability is thinking long term. Investors are thinking um, um, about, about customers and future profits. Investors are thinking about risk. Inventors, investors want to de-risk their decision. The more they know, the more they know about a business, the less risk, the less risk they take in investing by producing. Yeah, the less risk they have, they, they take in investing. Yeah, they want to de-risk their investment. The more they know about a business, the less risk they are taking. That's why it's an important part of it. Now, you can say, look, that's three out of four. That's enough. Um, so it's about increasing their confidence. Yeah. What else? Um, employees. Yeah. We could talk about employees. We're trying to talk about investors. But I think investors, you know, investors will be reassured that um, businesses are thinking that businesses that think about uh, sustainability will improve the staff morale and staff retention. Staff are key. To the success of a business and uh, in inverted commas, good slash green companies will find it easier to attract and retain staff. So I don't know. Uh, for me, uh, that's almost enough. I might want to go back in a minute if I've got the time to uh, play with this and, and to expand. But I've got a 25 mark question here. I started the question on the hour and I've got 45 minutes to do my best. All right. And what I don't want to do is overdwell on a particular question. Um, I've set myself a target of doing four things. I'm writing um, in reasonable sentences. So for me, at this stage, I am moving on. Part B, yeah, part B. 
Part B is worth three marks. So that's about five minutes of my life. Try and say three things. Discuss any events affecting COLAT that might indicate an impairment test ought to be conducted in accordance with ISA 36 um, in accordance with impairment. So I've got to look at the um, information here. So I've got to understand, because I've got to look at the exhibits now, how we can structure the information. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm putting that information out there. And what are we being told? Discuss the discuss any events affecting Calat which might indicate an impairment test ought to be conducted. So external, internal. As a result of the natural disaster, the share price of Colet has declined. So we've got a fall in the share price. And some non-current assets were destroyed. And there's a decline in customer demand. There's a decline in customer demand. Non-current assets were destroyed. Well, if an asset is destroyed, you don't do an impairment review. It's, it's destroyed. It's written off. Um, the fair value of this was that. Um, OK, so discuss, which indicates. Now, the share price, there's a decline in customer demand. So I think that's important because if the customer demand goes down, sales will go down. If sales goes down, that affects the uh, value in use, the present value of the future cash flows, because if no one's buying it, a decline in the customer demand will lead to a reduction in the estimate of the future cash flows, the value in use will be lower. This is an indicator. This is an indicator. I suppose we don't really need to say that because we're, we're answering the question. So that's one of them for me. Now, the other one is the share price. The other one is the share price because there's something about market capitalization. So if you've got the net assets, the business as being 100, normally the, the market shares, the value of the business is a lot more. But if the net assets are 100 and the share price and the market capitalization is only 60 or 70 because the share price has fallen, it indicates the market doesn't think those assets are worth that amount. So it's an indicator of an impairment review. So the fall in the share price, fall in the share price may reduce the market capitalization to being less than the carrying value of the net assets. Thus a review. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've done this question before. I know there's a third one. In fact, there's probably two more, but they just don't jump at me. And the very first time I did this question, they didn't jump at me either. And therefore, I'm just going to leave it for now, because rather than flog a dead horse and, and, and you know, I want to move on. I want to keep moving. So I've got the option. I've got the ability of coming back if I want to and expanding on a third point. Um, I just feel a bit of pressure as a tutor to get the answer right, right. You just want to pass. So two out of three is all right. Discuss how the following should be accounted for in the financial statements, the destruction of the net assets and the decommissioning of the plant. So first of all, we've got the destruction. So that's one thing I'm going to talk about. There are four marks available here. So if I've got four marks, where are you gone? Where, where have you gone? Yeah, let's, let's have you here. Let's have you here. So we're going to talk about the destruction. And we're also going to talk about the decommission. 
Now the destruction of and two marks each. Two marks each. Yeah. So how are we gonna how are we gonna get two marks for talking about the destruction of the asset? Um, if an asset is destroyed, it means it will be written off, and then the loss will go um, to the PL. So an asset that has been destroyed is no longer an asset as it has no economic benefits. It will be removed, i.e. de-recognized from the accounts. Yeah, so that's one thing. And then the second thing to say is, well, that's going to give you a loss. You could put the loss in the PL, or you could put the loss in no, 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 put it in the PL. Yeah. Um, the loss from such a write-off is recognized in PL. It is a non-cash expense. Right, yeah. And I'm moving on, yeah? I'm saying something simple. Decommissioning, what is this decommissioning? The decommissioning of the power plant. The non-current assets of Colette were destroyed at a carrying value of 250. Um, and the fair value of these assets was 280 based on an influence before that date. So uh, uh, the loss, so the loss would be 250, wouldn't it? Um, the loss, of 250, yeah, from such a write-off is recognized in the PL. All right. So it doesn't matter what it's worth. That might be an insurance claim, I suppose. In addition, they've determined the power point will have to be closed and decommissioned earlier than expected. The remaining useful life of the power plant has been reduced from 25 to eight years. So now this is getting quite technical, really, because what you've got here is ISA 37 interacting with ISA 16. Because you built a power plant, you've created yourself an obligation to remove it, decommission it, and you'd capitalize that. And because you'd have the obligation as soon as you've done it. So what we're doing is revising the estimate. And to me, useful life changes is to do with um, a revision of an estimate rather than a change of accounting policy. So the change from 25 to eight years for the life of the asset is a revision of an estimate. Yeah, it will be dealt with on a prospective basis. Yeah, it will be dealt with going forward. It's not going to be dealt with on a retrospective basis. It's going to be dealt with on a prospective basis. Um, yeah, and, and you're shortening the life. You're shortening the life. So the cost of removing that liability or the cost of removing the plant, the liability to do so, presumably will still be the same. But instead of it being in 25 years time, it's in eight years time. And, and, and so when it's in the future, it's discounted. So if it's discounted by 25 years, it's quite small. But if it's only been discounted by eight years, suddenly it becomes bigger. So, yeah, the liability, the liability to decommission is now revised upwards as it is only discounted by eight and not 25 years. That's really quite technical, isn't it? Now, what you've then done, I'm sorry to do this to you, 
But what you've then done, if you've made the liability bigger, you've credited the liability and you'd be capitalizing that. So this also means the plant is increased as such costs are capitalized. Ooh, ooh, yeah? How is that? How is that for you? Yeah, that, that's, you know, that's quite a little bit of application going on there. That's quite a little bit of application going on there, which I'm comfortable with. Now, what that means is the plant is going up in value, carrying value. And so maybe that's another indicator of impairment because you've now got a higher carrying value. Yeah. Um, so we could go back. This is how I answer the question. It's not necessary. You know, I'm, I'm th you're seeing into my brain. Yeah, the power plant will have a higher carrying value because of the revision to the useful life and the increase in the measurement of the liability. And if you've got a higher asset, then that's, again, the recoverable amount may be the same, but the carrying value has gone up. So you're indicating there that could be. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel comfortable with that. I feel comfortable with that. Um, tiddly um pum pum, what else have we got going on here? Yeah, so I feel comfortable that we've done two marks about the destruction. And I feel comfortable that we've done two marks about the decommissioning because it was a little four mark exercise. So I'm feeling very good about myself. The cost of repairing the environmental damage and the potential receipt of government compensation. Um, the cost of repairing the environmental damage. Colat has in the past repaired minor environmental damage it has caused, but has never suffered a natural disaster on this scale. There is no legal obligation for Colat to repair or restore damage caused by the disaster, as this will be the responsibility of the government. The government has announced there will be compensation, announced there will be compensation of 50 million to repair the environmental damage and companies should apply for the compensation. By the 1st of March, when the accounts were approved, Colat had only received acknowledgement. So again, we've got a situation here where we've got that word and. So it's the cost of repairing the environmental damage. So that's one thing I'll talk about. And then the other thing I'll talk about is the government grant. Yeah is the government grant. So there's two things at play here. And there's two things at play here. Um, now, the first is the cost of the environmental damage, the cost of the environmental damage. Colette has in the past repaired minor environmental damage. So That Colette has in the past repaired environmental damage links to me to one of the key criteria for the recognition because it's raising a valid expectation. It's creating a constructive obligation that Colette has in the past repaired environmental, has repaired, you know, um, creates a valid 
expectation creates a valid expectation and hence constructive obligation that it will do so again. Two marks. Um, but it was minor. Um, they've never suffered a natural disaster on this scale. And it's the responsibility of government. So the cost of repairing the environmental damage is not mine. Yeah, is not mine. However, this is on another scale. And Colette has no legal obligation. This is the responsibility of the government. On that basis, no revision should be made or disclosed. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous, all right? But I've tried to say two things. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, you know, there are three conditions under ISA 37 that have to be met, probable, reliable measure, whatever. Government grant. Government grant. So the government has announced, yeah, our year end is 31st December. Um, we've received an acknowledgement. So the government grant. So. Um, Colette has a potential government grant. Should we recognize that as an asset at the year end? We haven't received it, but getting cash is not the criteria for when you recognize an intangible asset, when you recognize a, a grant. What you've got to have is a reasonable expectation. Colette? as a potential government grant. It can be recognized as an asset at the reporting date if it is, if there is a reasonable expectation, if there is a reasonable expectation that it will be received. Um, and is there? What do we know? Um, we should apply. So we're told that we should apply. Uh, and when the accounts are being approved, they had only received an acknowledgement, but they hadn't got the approval. Now, I don't know. Do you trust your government? Do you trust your due processes to filling these things correctly? should be okay, but the wording of the question suggests that it's only been acknowledged, yeah? So at the reporting date, um, so when the accounts are being signed off, there is no, there is, uh, there is no approval, there is no approval. Just acknowledgement. On that basis, it is prudent. Cautious, yeah, prudent. Not to anticipate such monies on the basis that it is not reasonably certain. All right. So for me, you know, for me, uh, what we've got going on there um, is, 
you know, uh, again, if I look at it, it's four marks. I'm breaking it down. Bish, bash, bosh. Yeah, um, and that's fine. All right, so I'm moving on. I'm feeling good. I've been looking at this question for 27 minutes so far. I've been looking at this question for 27 minutes so far. And then I get a question about hedging. And I think, oh, my God, I'm depressed. So let me leave the hedging one out. Come back to that in a minute. Um, let's think about what we can do, which is the potential insurance policies. So Colette has insurance, provides compensation for losses um, on the fair value, temporary relocation estimated at two, revenue costs, revenue lost. It's unclear. Um, it is unclear which events are covered by insurance policies. It's unclear what is covered by insurance policies. That doesn't sound great to me when you when you when you read it like that. Significant uncertainty exists. Significant uncertainty exists. Yeah, um, but it was uh, pro there's probable that the insurance claim for the loss of the non-current assets. So there's a probability there um, in respect of that. Um, yeah, OK, so this is uh, four marks. Am I going to get four marks out of this? I don't know. It's it's. Not something that really grabs me, if I'm honest. Um, so this is this is in relation to an insurance claim. So the insurance claim is a contingent asset. Yeah. So the uh, insurance claim um, is an example of a contingent asset. Yeah, um, why don't I like that? What's going on there with that formatting? Why don't I like that? Should I get obsessed with this? No, uh, let me drop that in there. Ah, whatever. The insurance claim is an example of a contingent asset. Uh, such assets. are only recognized, what is it, virtually certain when they are virtually certain. No claims are virtually certain. No asset should be recognized. The one for plant that is probable could be disclosed in the notes to the accounts. The one that relates to um, events and costs other events and costs, other events is uh, too uncertain and should not even be disclosed, something like that. All right, should not even be disclosed, should not even be disclosed in the notes. Um, contingent assets are always dealt with on a, on a separate basis. These should be considered separately from any liability. So you don't net the two off, all right? So something like that, you know, and I think that's fairly easy. And it would be very, 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 very frustrating if, if you didn't, answer that part of the question because you were panicking all about the hedge. But I now have time to go back and you pick your low hanging fruit first. And I have time to go back to talk about the commodity uh, risk associated with this. And I've got, I don't know, 10 minutes left or so. I've got four minutes, four marks. So I still got a little bit of time in my favor. Collect hedges, commodity price risk in aluminium. 
and such transactions were classified as highly probable in accordance with IFRS 9. So what we're engaged in here is a hedge. And what we're hedging is a price risk. Um, and these transactions are no longer expected to occur. Now, if we're going to answer a question like this, we may not get a four out of four. In some respects, I don't care if you get four out of four. I suppose I care if you get two out of four. And you've got to get the first mark first, the hedge of the commodity price risk in aluminium. So what we're talking about here is a derivative. We're using um, the derivative as a hedging instrument. So the company has used a derivative uh, as a hedging instrument. Now that in itself is not going to get me any marks, but it's setting the scene. Uh, such instruments must be accounted for at fair value. Yeah, this we know must be measured at fair value. The default is to take gains and losses to PL. Um, so if we wanted just to personalize that a little bit, we could say collapse. So I kind of started with a simple, and if that's all you write, you get one mark. And one mark is better than no marks. <laughs> now, what type of hedge is it? Are we hedging, is it a fair value hedge or is it a cash flow hedge? It's a fair value hedge if the derivative can be paired, if the risk that the derivative is covering is a change in the fair value of an asset or liability that exists in the books. Now, what we've got here is a highly probable future transaction. So it's a cash flow hedge. And there's a mark going to be available for identifying that it's a cash flow hedge. The risk being covered is a highly probable future transaction. This means it is a cash flow hedge. This means it is a cash flow hedge. All right. Um, with a cat, then you need to know the accounting treatment. Yeah. With a cash flow hedge, uh, the gain or loss is not taken to PL. Uh, the gain or loss on the derivative is not taken to PL. Rather, it is taken to equity, brackets, other comprehensive income. Um, to the extent it is effective, to the extent that it is effective, it can then be recycled back when the actual transaction occurs. All right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm happy with that but I still haven't quite answered the question because the transaction is not going to occur. So we've got this cash flow hedge. We've got this gain or loss in the reserves in, rela in relation to the derivative because you've got to recognize the derivative at value. So the change in the value goes to the reserves with a cash flow hedge, but there's not going to be a future transaction to match it against. So just clear it out and take it to PL. In these, um, however, because it is no longer 
needed as a cash flow hedge as the transaction will not occur This means the reserve balance is not appropriate. The gain or loss sitting in reserves can be recycled, reclassified, can be recycled back to PNL. There we go. So, you know, I can produce a longer answer. I can produce a better answer. Um, but I have produced this answer with all its slight um, foibles and spelling within the time allowed. I've still got a few minutes left. I've still got a few minutes left. All right. And in the exam, I would be I would be moving on. And so, you know, what I want to what I wanted to show you was it is possible to answer these questions to time if you're brutal, if you're aggressive. Yeah, and you know, this is how you should try and think about structuring your answer structuring your question using the practice platform yeah in answering the question i mean i you know i could go back and i could polish slightly but i'm, I'm not going to i'm just going to take a moment i'm just going to take a moment to uh to reflect now there is a question that has come in from sabatha which says you know the decommissioning of the, the earlier decommissioning of the plant does not produce extra economic benefit. So how can the cost be capitalized? According to ISA 16, it should be expense. Well, the earlier decommissioning of the plant doesn't produce any extra economic benefit, but it produces an extra cost. So you capitalize that cost in order to get economic benefit from a power plant. You've got to install it and decommission it. And if we're revising the estimate of the cost of decommissioning it, we're revising the estimate of the cost of the asset. So the first thing we do is we capitalize that extra cost. Then we test it for impairment. It's an indicator because we've risen the carrying value. There's an, there's, we, we're then going to do the impairment review. So um, Sabitha, I hope that answers uh, that particular a question uh, that you raised in the chat that I saw there. Uh, Schwab has said, can we copy the requirements as you did and answer in the same way? Yes, yes, yes. And this way, when you're, you've got one less screen to navigate, because if you've got the requirement open and the answer open, and the exhibit open, you've got three screens to navigate. This is what I mean about making the practice platform your home. You've got to make it your home. Yeah, so you can manipulate the information the way that you want to. So look, some of you won't have seen the practice platform before. And this is how you're going to be doing your exam. It's not a written exam. It's not done on Excel. It's not done on your approved learning provider's own particular little system. It's done on the ACCA system. And so you've got to make this format. You've got to be able to, you know, oh, if you want to do a calculation. Yeah, you've got to be able to, you know, use the calculator. You've got to feel how it is. Scratch pad. I just, I don't bother with the scratch pad myself because the marker will never, ever see the scratch pad. If you want to plan your answer, You've seen how I planned my answer and I planned my answer by, you know, writing out the headings and then and then and then building it up from there. So, look, you've been very patient with me as I've gone through that question. Some of you will have been familiar with that question before uh, and familiar with the fact the examiner's answer is a little bit better than mine. 
That's okay. This answer I'm giving you, I'm confident, is a prize-winning answer. I really am. Yeah, it's a prize-winning answer. You can't do better than this in the time allowed. Yeah, yeah, working it live. So look, I am going to um, uh, stop sharing for a moment and then have a new share because I've got a couple of other things uh, that I want to talk to you about in terms of the um, presentation. And where were we? Because we were partway through the presentation, weren't we? We were partway through the presentation. And we'd got to the point, I think, uh, where um, I'd like some Q and A's. Um, I've got a little last minute, five minute story to do. Um, but I'm looking at the uh, Q and A's now, I think, and you should be able to see there. So um, I wonder what questions have been coming in. Let me sit back and let me uh, think about, the, uh, let, me, let, me, let me see what questions have come in and the order in which they want to be addressed. Okay, Tom, uh, I shall read you a few questions because uh, there are a few questions coming in. Good. While you are doing, you are showing the students about how to answer the questions from the practice platform about the yes. Colette Co. Okay, we have 10 questions actually coming in uh, from students. I shall read you question one. Yes, please, just one question at a time. I'm only, okay. um, I'm only human. Sure. There's one question from Chu Li Ping. May I know the question of destruction and decommission? The question did not indicate have any liability. Can I answer the commission, the decommission of power plant from 25 years to eight years, the net carrying value is decreased was due to revise the accounting policy, for example, depreciation. No there, was no, there was no change in accounting policy at all. There was a specific reference to the decommissioning provision. So we already knew that ISA 37 was in place. We already knew that the liability had been set up and would be discharged in 25 years time. So that was part of the question. We were not changing our policy at all. We were revising an estimate. And so we were depreciating the asset, the capitalized asset uh, over eight years instead of 25 years. And we were remeasuring that liability um, because it would only be discounted by um, eight years, not 25 years. So no change in accounting policy most definitely a uh, revision of an estimate and the provision was already there. So that answers that question. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next question is anonymous. Should we remove the requirement in the answer sheet that we paste before we submit our answer? That's a very good question. Um, I don't care. It would simply take me another few moments to remove the requirement. The markers will be very familiar with the requirement, so you're not going to fool them and suddenly get marks for including the requirement, but you're not going to be penalized for leaving the requirement in the answer. And therefore, save time. Leave it there. Not a problem. Save time. Leave it there. It's not a problem. Thank you. Thanks. Next question. When we copy and paste the requirement to answer sheet, will the alignment run during the actual exam? The practice platform will run the alignment. It may well be that when you copy, cut and paste and drop it in, it may well be that the alignment needs reformatting. So it may well be in some questions that you will have to reformat it and break down the requirement by using your tab button. That can happen, yes, but I still say it's a worthwhile investment in your time because it means that you will 
have the question that you are answering in front of you as you begin your answer and it constantly reminds you what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, next question. What is your advice if we encounter a question that we completely do not have any answer? Should we leave it for last attempt or just write something or just ignore it? I think if you ignore it and write nothing, you're, you're taking a risk that you're going to be marked out of 90 or you're going to be marked out of 85 or you're going to be marked out of... And, and, and to pass this exam, you need to be marked out of as many marks as possible. I think, um, you know, when I was a student, I faced this problem. Um, you look at a question and it means nothing to you. And, and there will be questions in the exam where this happens. And one thing that you can draw some comfort from, if it's weird for you, if you haven't seen it before, if it's freaking you out, it's probably freaking everybody else out. All right. And, and you, 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 you should take some sort of comfort from that, that it's challenging and difficult. I think you put it to one side and come back to it, but you must come back to it. And when you come back to it, several things to think about. Is there a key word in the question that you can define? Is the word impairment there? Is the word intangible there? Is, is, is the word derivative there? Is there something that you can define? Because that gets you starting. Secondly, um, can you relate it to the framework? Are, are, are we talking about, is it an asset? Is it a liability? Is it useful information? Is there some angle? Because if it's an unknown situation, how do we solve unknown situations? We solve unknown situations by going back to core principles, by going back to the framework. So that's my advice. I think, I think the questioner was wise when they suggested come back to it. You do need to come back to it and then write something down. If it's five marks and you only end up with one mark out of it, you, you've salvaged something. All right, you've salvaged something, but it's always going to be easier to get the first mark out of five than it is to get the fifth mark out of five. So even if your favorite topic is there and it's five marks, you've got to walk away from it because you'll max out on the marks. So that's a good question. Thank you very much. OK, we have a few more couple questions coming in from students. Super. I shall, yeah. May I know whether I would deduct mark if stating wrong standard numbers or standard name, is it acceptable without stating any specific standard to write our answer? There is never any negative marking. There is never any marks deducted. And there is never any marks awarded for saying PPE is I say 16. There's never any marks awarded for saying intangible assets is I say 38. Never, ever, ever. So you can always get away with simply saying the standard on PPE requires depreciation. The standard on intangible assets requires capitalization when. All right. So don't feel under stress. I know the examiner's answer sometimes quotes chapter and verse. That's to help you as a student. It is not showing you what you need to replicate in the exam. Thank you for your question. Okay, next questions. I realize that you haven't explicitly mentioned any IFRS or IAS standard. So are we allowed to do the same? Yes. Example, mentioning principles and explaining. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. The answer to that question is yes. Next question, what's the difference between fair value hitch and cash flow hitch? And what is, the, what is their function used in the business? Good question. I, on my podcast, I have a 15 minute version of answering that question. So I would encourage you to go and listen to my podcast and you will hear me explain that for 
15 minutes. Let me give you a one minute explanation. Hedging is about the management of risk. And businesses face risks. If you've got some gold or some coal or some foreign currency, that asset could fall in value because the price of it could come down. So you could use a derivative that would give you a gain if the asset fell in value. Now, that would be a fair value hedge because if you're worried about the fall in the fair value of a recognized item in the accounts, the loss on the hedged item would be there. The gain on the, on the derivative, the hedging instrument would be there and you'd pair the two together. A cash flow hedge is about a highly probable future transaction and is accounted for in OCI, so you can recycle later. But a longer, more slower, more measured explanation is given on my podcast. Okay, next question. Can we perform calculations on Word instead of Excel file attached? I'm going to be really picky here in, in, in the language of that question. The ACCA practice platform doesn't have Word, and the ACCA practice platform doesn't have Excel. Yeah, there's a Word response area, and there's a spreadsheet response area, and their functionality is different. You should do the words, the narrative words, in the Word response area. If there are lots of numbers, then you can elect to use the spreadsheet function. If it's a couple of numbers, there would be nothing wrong with you doing a small table or there would be nothing wrong with you using the word um, functionality or, I mean, you know, the calculation of goodwill is three numbers. Yeah. Investment, NCI, net assets. Yeah. And if you, if it's quicker for you to open up a little table in the middle of your word, do it. All right. What I don't want to see, what I don't want to see is the spreadsheet functionality with lots of words in it. That's horrible for the markets. All right. So develop your style, develop your confidence, have your strategy, make the practice platform your home, practice exam questions. What do you find quicker to do? All right. Um, I tend to find small calculations quicker to do on the Word format, but I do sometimes use the spreadsheet functionality. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer there. Thank you for that question. Next question. Can we mention the accounting standards and relate it to case study? I don't see you mention any accounting standard in the answers. I think we've related to, we've, we've talked about this before. We don't need to say ISA 16 accounting standard on property, plant and equipment. Yeah, um, we can simply say the standard says. So I'm comfortable with, if, if, if you're explaining to a client, you know, if, if, a doctor is, is, if a doctor is talking about your broken arm, they don't need to tell you that it's the fibula, tibula, whatever it is. Yeah, they don't need to tell you the name of the drug that's going to make you better. They say, take this. This will make you better. And the reason it will make you better will suppress the pain. So we've got to be really careful because the idea is that in the exam, we're not talking to a, uh, we're talking to non-accountants and they don't need to be recited chapter and verse as to which accounting standard we're drawing the information from. So relax, relax, answer the question. And the question never is recite for me yeah, the accounting standard number um, that, that, that the, the question is drawn from. Okay, next one. I'm often, con I'm often confused with what goes to PL and what goes to OCI. So am I. So am I. Because it's not clear. And the old framework... Um, was silent, which is why the revised framework provides us with some guidance. But we must follow the accounting standards. And the accounting standards uh, solve the issue on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So the default is that you take things to P&L, but there are certain standards which require things to be done in reserves and therefore also presented in other comprehensive income. Um, so in OCI, you get things like group exchange differences, pension remeasurement, um, revaluation gains on fair value through OCI investments. So it, it, it is, I'm afraid, a ad hoc rules-based list. It's not 100% logical. That's why it's um, difficult. You have my empathy. Okay, thanks Tom for the question, for the answer. Should we, another question, should we do reference to standards like IAS 8 for the changes in useful life? Will there be no, any- No, 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 no. So we've, 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 we've covered, this, covered this question in other forms before. You don't need to quote the name of the standard in answering the question. Okay, next question. What percentage of the paper is theory-based and numerical-based? I have practiced some open-ended NCI goodwill questions and I have observed that there are plenty of steps to solve and take a very long time to solve. Okay, if you go into this exam thinking it's a number-based exam, you're naive. It, this is an exam which is we're at the level of the accounts have already been prepared and we're tweaking them and we're explaining them and we're technical. So there are numbers in the exam. But I don't know, 10 percent. 10 percent. 15 percent. Yeah, you're not going to prepare a set of group accounts. You know, um, you know, a question on deferred tax. You know, the numbers on deferred tax are fairly simple. What's the tax rate? What's the difference? You know, what's the temporary difference, timing difference, whatever. And therefore, you know, that's it. So, but there's a lot more to explain. So, um, yeah, you, you don't need to take my word for it. You need to go onto the ACCA practice platform, have a look at their past exam questions and their practice tests. And you'll find 80% plus of an exam is for written narrative, explaining, discussing. Yeah, synthesizing, applying rather than number crunching. Okay, okay Tom, since we are almost we are at 6 p.m., we take a couple more questions and then I shall give you some time to wrap up your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, one, uh, three more last questions. How many minutes should be allocated to one mark question? Oh, what a lovely question. What a perfect question. You have three hours and 15 minutes in the exam. And historically or, or apocryphally, you've got 50 minutes reading time. Don't sit there for 15 minutes reading it before you start. Don't do that. You've All the questions are compulsory. You've developed your own exam strategy. So just crack on with it. Just crack on with it. Um, what I do, because I'm a little bit old fashioned, I, I think of it as a three hour exam. So I think of it as 180 minutes. So I think of it as 1.8 minutes per mark. I think of it as 25 marks is 45 minutes. So we did a 25 mark question there, just under 45 minutes. Now that leaves you with 15 minutes that you can kind of go back to and overrun with. But your first question you should do should be the best question. And you try not to overrun, because if you put yourself um, behind, if you put yourself under that additional pressure, uh, that's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. So 1.8 minutes and you still then will have a little bit of free time to reflect. And you will need a moment in the exam to go. <sighs> you need you need a, a moment to kind of just. 1.8 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, two more last questions for you. I am having issue in remembering the rules of standards as I forget the wording used in the definition of standards. So can we state the rule in our own wording when answering? Please, please state it in your own words, please. 
that is better than the formal dumping and regurgitation. Please use your own words. Yeah, relax. It's fine. Okay, last question. What is your advice to deal with the question about ethical issue? How can I structure the answer for this type of question? Oh, what a good, what a, what a, what a wonderful question. What a great question. And again, part of my answer is going to be, you know, I've got a podcast on how we approach the ethical questions. Um, I, you know, with everything, it's about answering the question that is set. And ethical questions are in a context. So don't, don't write out the five pillars. No marks in that. Look at the information, answer the question, and try and relate the facts that you're looking at in the question back to the ethical pillars. So if somebody has made a mistake, explain that the accounting treatment is wrong, why it's wrong. Yeah. If somebody is, um, if somebody has lied to the board of directors, explain that that is not a professional thing to do, but then relate it back to integrity, relate it back to competence and say that professionals are expected yeah, to act with integrity to mislead the board of directors is therefore unethical. Yeah, Accountants are expected to be competent. This is another example of an accounting error. Therefore, it's unethical behavior. And so short sharp simple sentences like that if you've got accounting issues first and ethical issues all kind of mixed up deal with the accounting issues first so that you deal with the accounting issues and then the ethical issues you can try and draw back and see the wood from the trees so that you you get an overall picture because there might be a pattern of expenses which are being manipulated to boost profit in some way and therefore, not only is it mistakes being made, which you could argue is competence, but it might well be um, deliberate, might well be deliberate. Is that our last question? Is that the, it, because I've got a, a just a few minutes to talk about something else? Uh, is that yes. okay if I? Okay, yeah. all right. So my, my, my very last couple of minutes is, is just to give you some general advice as to what to do in the coming weeks as you prepare to do the SBR exam. And as you get closer and closer to the exam, you need to build your confidence and you need to wind down rather than wind up. So I don't want you the night before the exam working to midnight. I don't want you the night before the exam suddenly trying to get to grips for the very first time with cash flow hedges. So you've got to build your confidence and you've got to revise your revision so that when you're in the exam, you're able to recall what you know. And you've heard me say these things before. Listen to my podcasts. You've heard me say these things before. Make the practice platform your home. You are never going to feel 100% confident. You're never going to walk out of that exam with 100 marks in the bag. That's not the game. But you've come a long way. And where you need to get to is to pass the exam, not to get 100%. So draw confidence on how well you have worked. You've attended today. Take on board the advice. Yeah. So on exam day, you've got to be in a positive frame of mind. Usain Bolt. He was, he was dancing, wasn't he? Yeah, just before the race. He was relaxed. And because he was relaxed, he was able to perform at his best. All right? And that is all that you can do is do your best. All right? And that's why you're putting in the work now. So on the day, you can be as relaxed and positive as possible. The question you will be asked in the exam will be a unique question. You won't have seen it before, but nor will anybody else. So you've got to make sure that you are TQ. You read the question or, 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 or because you can only answer the question if you have first of all read it and understood it. And you need to read it fairly quickly. You can go back and you, 
you can reread it. Now, the requirement, that's so important. You copy, cut and paste and drop that into your answer so that you're focusing on that. And the exhibits are broken down, the requirement and the exhibit, the requirement and the exhibit. You don't have to read all of the exhibits and all of the requirements before you start answering the question. If you do that, you spend too long. And gain confidence by doing this in the ex by gain confidence by doing this on the practice platform in your mock exams. Part A will relate to exhibit one. Part B will relate to exhibit two. It's clearly labeled. Yeah, it's clearly labeled. And as we have talked about, it's a talking exam. It's a wordy exam. It's a narrative exam. And if you've got to do an explanation of deferred tax and a calculation or an explanation of goodwill and a calculation for my money, because more of the marks are for the words, you do the words first and the words should then bring out the format. The words should bring out what you are doing. Yeah. So for me, try and do the, the words first. Time allocation is crucial. Time allocation is crucial. You spend the time on the exam and you structure your answer totally related to the number of marks available. You saw it was a four marker. I broke it down into two and two. I made two points. I made two points. You know, so I was challenging the marker all the time. Give me one mark for this. And one mark is often given for one and a half, two sentences. You saw that in my answer that I was preparing live for you. You know, there was a sentence. There was another small sentence. There was a sentence. There was another, you know, and then I paragraphed it. And what I was doing in paragraphing it was challenging the marker. Give me a mark for what I've just done. Make sure, what does this slide show you? A jigsaw. A question trying to fit into the answer. Yeah, a question trying to fit into the answer. That's the wrong way around. The answer should fit the question. You cannot go into this exam with a preconceived answer that you then reproduce. It doesn't work that way. You've got to look at the question, think about the question, and answer the question. The only way, the only way you've got to answer the question that is set, not the one that you wanted to be asked, not the one that you did last time. Yeah? When I say to Louis, how old are you? I want him to say two. I don't want him to say, my name is Louis. His name is Louis, but it's not going to get him any marks. All right? Not going to get him any marks. Plan your answer. Yeah. If you can give a definition, give a definition. But most of the marks are going to be for the discussion and the application, as we have seen. Time management is crucial. You've got to stick to time. You've got to move on by doing questions. <clears throat> so I, I have a mock exam. I do, I set my students a mock exam on the ACCA practice platform. They're gonna be doing it in a couple of weeks time, right at the end. And this mock exam is an original exam and they get to do it to time. And, you know, I give them feedback, I give them support. I give them debrief videos. There's a whole thing going on there. And there's a whole valuable experience that they get to learn by doing an exam on the ACCA practice platform to time. And part of that experience, you don't have to be my student to do this, is, is the benefit of forcing yourself to do it to time. Yeah. I mean, obviously, only those students who come with me end up with, with, with getting to do the exam that I've sat. It's an original exam and with my feedback. But the, one of the real benefits from doing an exam to time is, the, is that feeling of pressure and that ability to move on. We've discussed that there is no such thing as negative marking. We've discussed that you've got to be positive that you're going to 
think positive that you're going to achieve and that if it gets tough it's tough for everybody right and you can now hope that the markers will be a bit more generous on the tougher areas but you've got to have a go there is no negative marking there is no negative marking so look yeah i wish you all the best i wish you all well but please don't rely on the mock please don't rely on the mock and if you've enjoyed the session if you've got something out of the session then then i'm very very pleased and you know let the acca know they put these sessions on for you and they would like to know whether you find them useful or not, all right? Because it's part of their uh, feedback, part of their remit. And if you have found it useful, another resource that you can use um, is my podcast. And you can easily find that on Spotify. So, if, so, so you might be listening to my voice when you're driving, when you're jogging, and if you're an insomniac, perhaps when you're going to sleep. Thank you very much indeed. I have enjoyed myself. I only wish that I could be with you there in person and then we could go out and have some chicken wings and enjoy the warm weather and hang out. But there you go. Um, I'm here in London in the winter. But there you go. All right. All the best, everybody. Thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Have a nice weekend. Thank you so much, Tom. We have come to an end of the webinar session. Once again, I would like to thank Mr. Tom for sharing the insightful tips with all of you, as well as answering all your questions that you have and to clarify some of your, your questions and your questions. I hope today's webinar will provide you the clarity of answers that help you to earn marks. No event will end without a feedback. We would like your assistant to complete the feedback form. The link of the feedback form will be dropped and shared in the chat box. Thank you everyone for attending. On behalf of ACCA, we wish you all the best in your upcoming exam. Have a great evening and stay safe. I just drop in the feedback form in the chat box. Please take a couple of minutes to complete the feedback form. We really appreciate your feedback to help us further improve our further future webinar session. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening. Stay safe.